I found you know, tend to be popular in the app site in the past regarding anesthesia and pharmacology. So we'll start off with a question about succinylcholine. Which of the following is true? It's a non-depolarizing muscle relaxant. It's relatively long-acting, easily reversible, or a potential side effect is hyperkalemia. That's right. Depolarizing, short-acting, not easily reversible, but hyperkalemia is a potential side effect. So we'll talk about muscle relaxants first. They basically can be neuromuscular competitive or non-competitive inhibitors at the neuromuscular junction. The only one used clinically that's non-competitive is succinylcholine. Basically rapidly binds the neuromuscular junction to cause depolarization. Um, fine muscle fasciculations can be seen within a minute after the medicine is administered, and it cannot be reversed. It's basically quickly broken down by plasma cholinesterases, so the activity of it is short, and it's frequently popular to facilitate endotracheal intubation when you must get a tube in pretty quickly. So only non-competitive inhibitor is succinylcholine. Side effects tend to be the most notoriously asked on test. Increased intracranial pressure, hyperkalemia, opening, open angle glaucoma, atypical pseudocholinesterases, malignant hyperthermia is basically a defect in calcium metabolism where calcium is released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which subsequently causes muscle excitation and relaxation sort of picture. The first sign of this is increase in end tidal CO2. Fever, tachycardia, muscle rigidity, acidosis may also be presenting signs. Basically, dantrolene, 10 milligrams per kilogram, can inhibit the calcium release and decouples the excitation complex. So everybody knows to treat with dantrolene. Additionally, cooling blankets, bicarb, glucose, supportive care. So dantrolene used to treat inhibits calcium release increase in end tidal CO2. On the note of competitive neuromuscular blockers, which of the following is not true? Rocuronium is an example. The effects can be reversed by an anticholinesterase such as neostigmine, unlike succinylcholine, which is not reversible. As well as providing neuromuscular blockade, these agents also provide a moderate amnestic effect, or all of the above are true. Do you guys think that stuff like rock is a competitive blocker? Reversible by neosigmine? And do paralytics also oftentimes cause some amnesia? It's, um... And bear in mind two things you can get in trouble when you're providing sedation to a patient. Number one, if you're going to provide neuromuscular blockers, they must have an airway secured. Stop breathing in very quickly situations can get out of control. Conversely, if a patient is on the ventilator and you're giving them a neuromuscular blocker, whether you're doing bronchoscopy or some other bedside procedure, airway secured, but these patients can hear and also um, don't have amnestic properties or pain, so they can feel pain and hear you, but potentially be paralyzed. So important to know that even though paralytics provided, other things are not. So we'll talk about competitive inhibitors. Pretty much except succinylcholine, everything else that we use clinically is competitive. They do not cause depolarization. They basically compete with the acetylcholine at the neuromuscular junction. How much block you get is in direct proportion of the concentration of the agent relative to the concentration of acetylcholine, which if you think about it then, if whatever can elevate the level of acetylcholine should be able to reverse the effects, although this definitely has a plateau in which it can't be reversed anymore. Anticholinesterases would be a good example of that, of how you can decrease the breakdown of ACH, subsequently actually increasing the amount that's there. So basically, um, giving a drug that blocks its breakdown can be a way to reverse the effects of these agents. Although bear in mind, the neuromuscular blocking agent is actually still present. However, if the concentration in relative to its concentration is high enough, then the patient basically can maintain contractility. Also, there is a ceiling effect. You can give enough of an anticholinesterase drug, or you can only give so much anticholinesterase drug that will elevate ACH to be able to reverse the effect. 
In other words, higher concentrations of non-depolarizing agents are not reversible. This is not similar or analogous to the way that naloxone reverses the effects of opiates basically because neostigmine doesn't compete or combine with it. Systemic consequences to increasing the dose of ACH, so basically get enough anti-cholinesterases on board. ACH is a predominant neurotransmitter in the preganglionic sympathetic and parasympathetic systems, as well as postganglionic parasympathetic nervous system. Um, anticholinergic drugs should also be given in situations where you anticipate that you're trying to increase the concentration of ACS to prevent the toxic effects of overdose of acetylcholine. Non-depolarized relaxants are frequently used in critically ill patients that are difficult to otherwise manage, such as patients who need to be hyperventilated for chronic head injury or ARDS. And as I mentioned, make sure that analgesic and amnestics are given. These basically don't have any properties to effectively control those issues. And the only thing that these, things, these medications essentially do is prevent the motion of voluntary muscles. In regards to muscle relaxants, it's best that they're given continuously if you know that you need to have muscle relaxation over a prolonged period of time and only want to give the amount that causes necessary relaxation. Basically, there are reports of patients developing prolonged muscle weakness even after the relaxant's been cleared. Pavi one's most notorious for this, and it's the effect of that's worsened when the patients are also being treated with steroids. If you, although we don't commonly use Pat Pavulon in the ICU, if you are giving this to a patient, it's recommended that you don't treat them with it continuously over two days, although granted I haven't done a critical care rotation in many years, but it would be unusual to keep someone on a paralytic nonstop for two days. Also bear in mind that not all muscles in the body are equally sensitive to the effects of a muscle relaxant. Diaphragm tends to be the most resistant, where the neck and pharyngeal muscles are the most sensitive. Bear in mind that intubated patients can spontaneously ventilate, generate a large in negative inspiratory effort, yet develop complete airway obstruction because the facial muscles and the muscles of the airway still have residual effects of the relaxant. So basically, diaphragm recovers first before these airway muscles. So even though they're breathing, you can extubate them and potentially still have their airway obstruct. If a patient can sustain a head lift because of all this, for five seconds, then it's usually considered safe to extubate the patient from at least a muscle relaxant standpoint. The next question, which of the following relaxing agents would be most appropriate to use in a 59-year-old patient with ES and adrenal disease and liver insufficiency? So in something like this, think about what is not primarily broken down by the kidneys or the liver. Any of these look like they're metabolized via other means. Close. Additionally, you can get prolongation of effect of muscle relaxation in patients who have myasthenia gravis who are hypothermic, hypercapnic. Some antibiotics actually can prolong the effect of muscle relaxation. Additionally, electrolyte abnormalities. So all these just to bear in mind in patients you otherwise expect to emerge quick, quick, quicker than what you're clinically seeing. Um, cystactricurium is the one that undergoes Hoffman degradation, so it's considered to be relatively safe to use in renal and liver failure. Not to say the other ones aren't, but your elimination obviously is going to be compromised, so they may stick around for a lot longer. Some other facts about the um, other commonly used relaxants. Mivicurium is a fast-acting one that can cause histamine release. Rock coronium is considered fast, usually broken down, or for the most part broken down by the liver. Pain coronium, on the other hand, is renal, slow acting, long lasting, although it can ca cause tachycardia. The next question, a 52 year old female just underwent a laparoscopic colostectomy and the anesthesiologist feels that the rock coronium is taking significantly longer than he would otherwise expect to wear off. Which of the following agents could be used to reverse the effect of this non-depolarizing muscular blocker? Atropine, edrophonium, neostigmine, or all of the above. So agents that can be used to reverse the effect of non-depolarizing. And actually, all of the above are correct in that case. 
basically neostigma encounters non-depolarizing agents in blocks the acetylcholine esterase, which subsequently increases ACH. Edrophonium also counters the non-depolarizing agents by blocking acetylcholine esterases. Atropine and glycopyrrolate can be given with neostigmine or edrophonium to counteract the effects of the general ACH overdose. A 69-year-old male with congestive heart failure is sent to you to receive a colonoscopy secondary to rectal bleeding. You are concerned about how he may react to anesthesia, so you start to give him a low dose of fentanyl. Which of the following is not true about fentanyl? It can provide excellent relatively short-acting analgesia, but not amnesia. It can cause hemodynamic changes indirectly because of histamine release. It provides moderate muscle relaxation, or all of the above. So fentanyl does cause pain relief, but not amnesia. There is some histamine release with opiate administration. So there's a couple mechanisms in which you can get hypotension when you give patients opiates, histamine release being one of them. However, it's not primarily thought to cause muscle relaxation. Morphine, demerol, and coding were the traditionally used narcotics. Still are to some extent. However, some of the newer generation ones that developed since the 1980s have become more popular. Zufetanil, alfetanil, fentanyl basically are more potent, shorter duration, and don't have quite as much of a problem with histamine release as for traditional opiates. They basically can produce profound analgesia and respiratory depression. There's no amnestic properties, no muscle relaxation properties, and no direct myocardial depressive effects. A couple of mechanisms in which opiates can produce hemodynamic changes the question, you know, we did mention histamine. Newer ones don't have quite as much of a problem with that, but all of them potentially can. But first of all, indirectly, they can cause hemodynamic changes by stimulating the release of histamine. The second, they can blunt the patient's sympathetic vascular tone because of their pain relieving properties. Acutely injured patients may be particularly sensitive to this for a couple reasons. There may be pain, so they're, well, obviously they're in pain and their sympathetic tone is going to be increased with subsequent increased peripheral vascular resist resistance, which also co can be compounded by hypovolemia. So therefore, these patients may be more sensitive than you'd expect when you administer opiates, causing significant hypotension. All the more important just to bear in mind to titrate them slowly and conservatively. Opiates frequently can be used as a primary anesthetic in combination with an amnestic and a muscle relaxant, especially in patients with significant myocardial dysfunction. When opiate levels become high enough, it can cause apnea because of the respiratory depressive effect, but the patient still potentially can breathe on command. However, if you increase dose of opiates high enough, they can be altogether apneic and responsive. Occasionally, opiates can cause chest wall muscle rigidity, which can make it even more difficult to ventilate patients, so it's a side effect just to bear in mind. Do not administer them in patients taking MAOIs because it can cause a hyperpyrexic coma. And as I mentioned before, primarily analgesic but not amnestic. Even though they do have a little bit of blunting of their ability to remember some things, it's not primarily amnestic and they can be sub totally aware of what's going on even though they may not be feeling the pain and have decent recall of conversations taking place, even though they appear to be relatively well anesthetized. The next patient is a 67-year-old female that underwent a laparoscopic LAR. Earlier in the day, you go to post op it's about four hours post-op since she'd been transferred out of recovery to the floor, and she seems much more drowsy than you'd expect, is mildly hypotensive, and breathing slowly. She received three doses of narcotics on top of her PCA, which a family member in the room admits that they are pushing because they didn't want her to be in pain. You suspect opiate overdose, so you give her naloxone. She initially seems more arousable, but within the hour, you call back because she seems more somnolent. Which of the following is most likely true about the situation? There must be something else going on with her outside of just opiate overdose because the effects of naloxone are long-lasting. It shouldn't have worn off in the short of a time period. Naloxone is a relatively safe agent with rare reports of cardiopulmonary side effects. 
It's only effective at reversing the newer opioids and less effective at treating morphine overdose. All of the above are correct, or none of the above are correct. So that's all bad. Basically, naloxone is relatively short acting, so you may be correcting your diagnosis. It's just opiate overdose, but the opiate on board may actually be something that's around and resistant for longer. And even though the naloxone initially was effective, it may not be. So if you suspect this condition, it's important that the patient's closely monitored. It does actually have a, it's notorious for causing some cardiopulmonary side effects, which we'll talk about in just a minute. But it is effective at reversing all sorts of opiates, not just the newer genera generation synthetic drugs. Basically, it also, in addition to reversing the analgesic re effects of the administered opiate, weight, it also affects the analgesic effects of native endorphins. So this really can actually be a pretty painful reversal. Naloxone administration is associated with pulmonary edema and myocardial ischemia, so certainly be judicious when you use it. Should not be used electively to reverse the effects of a narcotic, meaning that when the patient is just recovering from anesthesia, you shouldn't use it to expedite. This is something that should, its use should be reserved just for cases where, as listed above, where a patient's becoming, or starting to periapneic or unstable. The next patient is a 26-year-old male that is status post MVA. He has multiple lung bone fractures, a pneumothorax, and a grade 2 splenic laceration. He was taken to the OR by ortho and basically is brought back to you in the ICU, still intubated and sedated. You note that a diprovan drip is hanging. Which of the following is not true about this drug? Diprovan is lipid soluble. Diprovan has a long shelf life, so you can use it up to five days after you open the vial. It is an excellent rapid induction agent that is hepatically metabolized, and it can be painful at the site where you give it. So if you ever have given diprovan or received it, it actually hurts where it's injected. It is lipid soluble, but it actually breaks down relatively quick and it can itself become contaminated, so it should be used within hours of opening, not days. It is hepatically metabolized. Lipid soluble substituted isopropyl phenol. It produces a rapid induction of anesthesia within 30 seconds followed by awakening in 48 minutes, so it's an excellent turn-on, turn-off sort of agent. It can effectively produce total anesthesia for less stimulating procedures. It does provide amnesia, some analgesia, and some degree of muscle relaxation. Rapidly cleared through hepatic metabolism to inactive metabolites. Patients become alert very quickly after if this drug is, um, the effects are worn off. Another benefit is lower incidence of nausea and vomiting in, compar in comparison to other opiates or inhaled agents. So fast acting, fast reversed, hepatic metabolized, lipid soluble. Often used as continuous infusions in ICU settings, although bear in mind it can produce significant hypotension with induction doses. It's painful at the site of injection, although pre-treatment at the IV site with lidocaine can help. It is insoluble in aqueous solution. It basically comes dissolved in a lipid emulsion that has the associated risk of bacterial contamination, so should be used within six hours. The next patient is a 46-year-old male that suffered 30% total body surface area, second and third degree burns. He's given ketamine during one of his wound debridement sessions. Which of the following would you not expect from ketamine? Does ketamine provide amnesia and analgesia? Is it a sympathetic stimulant and it should not be used in patients who have a space occupying cerebral lesion? It is known to cause apnea even at low doses. And the effects are relatively fast, taking place within 60 seconds after it's given. So the good thing about ketamine is it does provide both amnesia and analgesia. Usually not famous for causing apnea at low doses, although it can have the potential to do that at higher doses. It is a sympathetic stimulant. 
should not be used in patients who have space occupying head lesions. A quick onset of action after given. Ketamine is a fencyclidine derivative that basically produces anesthesia that's characterized by disassociation between the thalamic and limbic systems. Induction of its effect takes place within 60 seconds after you give it. It will create a cataleptic-like state where the patient's eyes may remain open with a slow, nystagmic gaze. It provides intense amnesia and analgesia. Although unpleasant visual, visual and auditory hallucinations can progress to delirium, this is, however, significantly reduced if benzodiazepines are also given. So benzos can reduce that effect. Patients should be able to spontaneously ventilate at low doses, but bear in mind that if they start to vomit, they may have a decreased ability to protect their airway. Apnea can occur at higher doses. It can be useful in sedating combative patients because of its multi multitude of effects. It has both direct and indirect sympathetic nervous system simulatory effects. Can be used in hypovolemic patients. Basically, the sympathetic simulatory effect increases myocardial oxygen consumption and intracranial pressure. Therefore, ischemic heart disease is a relative contraindication, space occupying cerebral lesions. So if they bring one about any contraindications, bear in mind dimension brain tumor or ischemic heart disease, ketamine should be used cautiously or is altogether contraindicated. Switch notes to benzodiazepines now. Which of the following is not true about benzodiazepines? Most are primarily hepatically metabolized. Lorazepam or Ativan has a relatively long duration of action. They tend to have a synergistic effect when combined with narcotics. A and C only are all of the above. So think about Versed, Ativan, Xanax, Valium, and we'll talk about all those. So I'll give you benzos are hepatically metabolized. They do tend to have a synergistic effect. And relatively speaking, the rays of pain is longer acting. When referring to amnestic and anxiolytic benzodiazepines are generally the class that we're talking about. They are hepatically metabolized. In addition to their sedative properties and anxiolytic properties, they can be used as anticonvulsants. They are respiratory depressants. Valium is something that we don't use as much anymore for primary anesthesia. Diazepam, it's considered basically the original gold standard agent and it is longer acting. Midazolam or Versed is what we most commonly use. You'll see it all the time in the endoscopy suite, but water soluble, shorter duration of action. Many benzos are considered class D um, drugs in pregnancy. However, interesting, there's actually a fair amount of studies that say that the chance of developing birth effects is relatively, actually extremely low when giving benzos. That being said, it is considered to be contraindicated because it crosses the placenta. Lorazepam has a longer duration of action, however, obviously not routinely used intraoperatively and more commonly you may see lorazepam in the ICU. These will produce anxiolysis and some degree of amnesia, but no analgesic properties. And it's interesting to watch patients that, who might give this to you who may produce much more of that and not so much amnesia. It's almost always used in conjunction with an opiate or some sort of inhalation agent intraoperatively. Frequently, fentanyl is commonly used with it in the outpatient setting for conscious sedation procedures as they're both pretty fast acting and wear away quickly. Highly synergistic effects. Bear in mind though, some patients are very sensitive to Versed and fentanyl, although most of the time we can administer this reasonably safely and patients do fine. People can become apneic and unconscious pretty quick. So therefore, it's important whenever you're administering conscious sedation to start out in small doses, in particular in patients that have higher risk factors. 
a reversal agent for benzos is flunazinol, which basically is a competitive inhibitor. Um, similar to naloxone, it's certainly not a completely benign agent. And then it can cause seizures and arrhythmias. It is contraindicated in patients who have a high ICP or in status epilept epilepticus. So can't really think of why you'd want to give that in status epilepticus, but that said, bear in mind it's a contraindication. So that was anxiolytics. Next, we'll talk about local anesthetics. So of the local anesthetics, I know they like this one, and I'm sorry if I blew the surprise. Which of the following is most associated with an allergic reaction? Lidocaine, mepivacaine, tetracaine, or bupivacaine? There's a nice little way to remember which are esters versus which are amides. And do you guys know which are the ones more likely to cause Allergies, esters, or amides? Esters are. They all have an I in the cane part of it, but esters don't have an I in the first part. Amides do. So that's a way to remember which ones are associated with allergic reactions versus those that aren't. You can get allergic reaction with them amides, but it's much more common and notorious with the esters. The non-allergic ones have an I in the prefix that precedes the cane part. So of those choices, tetracaine is associated with allergic reaction. Which of the following is not true about local anesthetics? They temporarily block nerve conduction by binding to neuronal sodium channels. When epinephrine is added to local anesthetics, the effects can be prolonged as it help keeps, helps keep the agent localized. The total sympathectomy effect that can occur because of local anesthetics in spinals and epidurals is associated with decreased cerebral perfusion pressure and hypotension. A and B only are all of the above. So, Binding to neuronal sodium channels, that sounds pretty good. Epinephrine can keep the locals more localized. And we'll talk about the total sympathectomy effect that can be seen when given epidurals and spinal anesthesia and why that happens. But it is true that it will decrease cerebral perfusion pressure and cause hypotension. So all of the above are correct. Local anesthetics are the group of drugs that temp temporarily block nerve conduction by binding to the neuronal sodium channels, so sodium doesn't enter. As concentration increases around the nerve, first autonomic transmission is blocked, then sensory, then motor, so autonomic sensory motor. Adverse effects, you can get acute central nervous system toxicity due to excessive plasma concentration. I know everybody's always taught that when giving local that you should withdraw to make sure you're not in a major vessel to help prevent this sort of side effect. You can actually have hemodynamic and respiratory consequences due to excessive block of the symp sympathetic motor nerves. The ester group of these drugs is associated with a higher chance of allergic reactions. And basically, inadvertent intravascular inje injections or overdose because of rapid uptake in tissues for any sort of patient-specific reasons can actually lead to seizures. So be careful. If you hear the phrase total sympathectomy, it's something that's basically seen in spinals and in epidurals. What basically happens is it, this is due because of the local anesthesia in these administrations, and it causes a progressive blockade of the sympathetic nervous system. The sympathetic nerves, if you remember, travel along the thoracolumbar region with the first four thoracic branches, including the cardiac sympathetic accelerators. So when this is blocked, what you basically get is bradycardia, profound vasodilation. The patient subsequently will become very hypotensive. Oftentimes, their pressure falls so low, the cerebral perfusion pressure that's needed to maintain consciousness is too low, and they become unconscious. Other associated symptoms include bradycardia, hypotension. Oftentimes, they could become apneic. If treated quickly, it's easily remedied with a vasopressor, so person becomes hypotensive, 
seems to be kind of not behaving appropriately with the spinal, and you suspect this, phenylephrine or ephedrine usually works pretty well. However, it can lead to cardiac arrest if not treated promptly. Because of this total sympathectomy effects, higher than usual doses of epinephrine are needed if a patient develops cardiac arrest that you think is related to an epidural spinal, so they'll need 10 to 40 or 1 to 4 um, milligrams of epinephrine in adults. So just because of this blockade of cardiac accelerators, pressure falls, and this whole effect ensues. Long versus short acting, length of action, bupivacaine, lidocaine, and procaine. Epinephrine does keep these agents more localized. It's oftentimes preferred when giving local anesthetics for minor procedures. However, bear in mind that this can ex or potentiate the uh, risk for cardiac arrhythmias, so shouldn't be used in patients that have that pre-lying angina or areas of poor collaterals. In addition, not to be used in cases of utero placental insufficiency. As we talked about the esters and the amides, tetracaine, chloroprocaine, no eyes in the beginning. The reason why they cause allergic effects is related to metabolites that produce PABA. You can get allergic reaction with amides, but it's much less common. It's usually because there's some other component in the preservative that's basically used to um, formulate these concoctions. So if somebody does say that they're allergic to lidocaine, it usually isn't the same sort of reaction that they're talking about if they say, or you know, if somebody demonstrates that there's a history of allergic reaction to an ester. This next question is about a patient. You're doing volunteer surgical work overseas, and you perform a mastectomy on an otherwise healthy 60-year-old patient with breast cancer. Postoperatively, she develops jaundice, lethargy, and nausea. Her liver function tests are massively elevated. Hepatitis panel is otherwise negative. The anesthesiologist is concerned that this may be related to an inhalation agent that was used, inhalation agent that was used during her operation. Which of the following agents is most likely to cause this hepatitis-like picture? Nitrous oxide, halothane, isofluorine, or sevofluorine? And I like things to make it easy as possible. I always think H, hepatitis, halothane. And that has come up on the ab site in the past. We don't really use halothane in this country, so that's why I made it a foreign patient. But if that comes up, halothane is hepatotoxicity. <coughs> Next, we'll talk about inhalation agents and refresh your memory of what minimal alveolar concentration really means. It's basically the smallest concentration of inhalant in which 50% of people will not move when you make an incision. A small MAC basically means that the drug probably is more lipid-soluble and more potent, meaning it doesn't take much to make 50% of people not respond to incision. Speed of induction, inversely proportional to solubility. Of the inhalation agents, nitrous is fastest but has low potency. Amnesia, some analgesia, and unconsciousness with inhalation agents. They can blunt hypoxic drive. You also can see some myocardial depression, increased cerebral blood flow, and decreased renal flow. So inhalation agents, similar to ketamine, do have multiple effects. These also are a little more commonly associated with nausea and vomiting after anesthesia. Nitrous oxide is a fast-acting one with minimal myocardial depression. Halothane, slow, and it actually smells relatively good. So it's thought to be good for children. However, not used as commonly anymore, secondary to the risk of cardiac depression, arrhythmias, and halothane hepatitis. I would doubt this would happen, but halothane hepatotoxicity may be referred to. That's usually actually milder and self-limiting where halothane hepatitis itself is associated with fever, eosinophilia, jaundice, increased in liver function test, occurs in somewhere around 1 in 6,000 plus patients, so pretty uncommon. 
Risk factors include being female, obesity, age over 50, and prior exposure to the inhalation agents. It can actually progress to acute liver failure, hepatic ne uh, uh, necrosis, and be fatal. Influorine side effect causes seizures. These other two agents tend to be a little bit safer and more straightforward to use. However, they're more expensive. Isofluorine may be more commonly used for neurosurgical procedures, where sevoflurane is less myocardial depression with fast onset and offset with less laryngospasm, however, again, more expensive. So those are some key points that may, well, not only something you want to bear in mind clinically, but also stuff that can come up on the test. The next patient is a 54-year-old that you're going to do a screening colonoscopy on because he has rectal bleeding. In your pre-anesthesia assessment, you observe the following. So you can see in a big fat tongue, still see some of his soft palate, can't see his tonsillar pillars. When they ask you what his male and potty airway score is, what would you say? One, two, three, or four. So definitely with that level of obstruction, not a one. You can't see the soft palate altogether if they're four. So it leaves you between those two, and we'll talk about the differentiation of that in just a minute. Basically, this is just an assessment method, and if you're performing conscious sedation, it's almost always a part of the questions that you'll answer about the patient. It's used to evaluate the ease of obtaining an airway if necessary. Class 1 basically means a nice, healthy patient where you can fully visualize the soft palate, fossies, uvula, and the anterior and posterior tonsillar pillars. The difference between the class 2 and class 3 is we can actually see the falci still in the uvula. It's harder to see that with class 3. You can't see the falces, and you're basically still able to see the soft palate, though. However, class 4 is considered difficult, where the tongue is occluding most of the mouth, and you can't see the soft palate. So really, like most classifications, differentiating between 2 and 3 is usually the most significant. 1 and 4 is a bit more straightforward. Most of us in our patients are grade 2, although some of us may be grade 1. Grade 3 is not as un or excuse me, somewhat common in grade four, obviously, higher risk sort of patient. So you can see the full difference in which you can see with this little line, basically delineating where the soft palate is. Next case is a 76-year-old patient that you're about to operate on because you suspect she has dead bowel. She has a long-standing history of diabetes, peripheral vascular disease, atrial fib, and CHF. She is on two pressures by time you make it to the operating room and basically find that her whole small bowel is dead. What would be the appropriate ASA classification for this patient? Definitely not a one. I have to bear in mind what a six is. Because she's unlikely to survive for more than 24 hours, which could be ascertained by the fact she's on multiple pressors and dead bowel suspected. Multiple comorbidities, ASA 5. To review, ASA 1 is a normal healthy patient. ASA 6 is a donor. 2 is mild systemic disease. 3, severe systemic disease is limiting but not incapacitating. 4, incapacitating disease that's a constant threat to life where five is a morbid patient that you don't expect will survive more than 24 hours. Six is basically a organ donor. So difference between three and four, systemic diseases, but not necessarily immediately life-threatening. Four is more serious. Five, not expected to survive. Next patient is a 45-year-old female that's undergoing a laparoscopic cholecystectomy, and while you're performing the procedure, you're notified that her entitled CO2 suddenly rose. What is the most likely diagnosis of sudden rise of 
tidal CO2 in appropriate treatment? Is it pulmonary embolism? And you should put her in the decubitus position, place a central line and try to aspirate the air bubble. Is it disconnect from the ventilator? So you should just ensure the ventilator is connected. Alveolar hypoventilation, which can be treated by increasing the tidal volume or and or respiratory rate. Or none of the above sound like either appropriate treatments or etiologies of increased end tidal CO2. So increased end tidal CO2, etiology is usually some reason why there's alveolar hypoventilation can basically mean there's just atelectasis or some sort of pulmonary congestion. If it's a sudden transient rise, treat by increasing the tidal volume or respiratory rate. In contrast, the same patient undergoing a laparoscopic cholecystectomy, you notice that her end tidal CO2 suddenly falls, which is the most likely diagnosis and appropriate treatment. She most likely have a pulmonary embolism, and you should roll her on her slide and try to side and try to aspirate the air in a dependent position. Is it disconnect from the ventilator? So just ensure that the tubes are connected first. Alveolar hyperventilation, or none of the above. So potentially, two of these could be correct choices. However, more commonly, it's probably just disconnect. So if they give you a question like that, think disconnect, but then if they throw you in a pathway where they you know, say something to the effect that the tubes are connected, then think about things like pulmonary embolism or significant hypotension. Basically, entitled CO2 monitoring is a non-invasive way of determining CO2 levels in intubated and non-intubated patients. It uses infrared technology to monitor exhaled breath, determine CO2 levels both numerically and by waveform. It is directly related to the ventilation status as opposed to the arterial saturation of oxygen, which basically relates to the oxygenation of the patient. So entitled CO2 is related to the ventilation. Normal values, you can see 35 to 45. Lower probably is seen in hyperventilation, where high, higher is hypoventilation with subsequent either respiratory alkalosis or acidosis. Dependent on three variables, so carbon dioxide production, delivery of blood to the lungs, and alveolar ventilation. So it's a ventilatory measure. Things that can cause increased CO2, either mechanisms in which the CO2 clearance is decreased or in which the CO2 production is decreased. So you have decreased CO2 clearance and decreased central drive, muscle weakness, or problems with diffusion. Increase in production of CO2 with subsequent ETCO2 increase. Fever burns, hyperthyroidism, seizures, bicarbonate. Release of tourniquets and reperfusions. I'm sorry, that's an error there. Decreased in tidal CO2, conversely, either is that there's an increased clearance mechanism in CO2, decreased delivery to the lungs, or ventilation perfusion mismatch. So hyperventilation, hypothermia, sedation, paralysis, a decreased cardiac output, or ventilating non-perfused lungs. Any questions? All right, guys, have a good day. Thanks.